The new year is often a time of reflection, a chance to look back on the past 365 days and remember. Sometimes the memories bring a smile, and other times they break our hearts. Chances are you've experienced a bit of both this past year. The new year is also a time to look ahead, to imagine what could be, to scan the horizon with expectation and seek God's guiding hand. It's a time to strive for better, to live louder, love stronger, and be more of who God has created us to be. It's an opportunity for new beginnings, a chance to start fresh, to pursue God with a renewed passion, and to press on with all our hearts. The truth is, God has been faithful this past year, and that faithfulness promises to carry us through the next. As the new year begins, may we remember this one simple truth. In Christ, we are a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come.
see everybody here. So you guys are the people that really love Jesus because a little bit of snow didn't scare you away, okay? You're here in person. If you're watching online, we still love you. Don't, you know, I'm not judging you at all, so don't worry about it. <laughs> hey, my name is Brian. I'm on staff. Maybe this is your first time here, and if it is, I welcome you. And uh, who, who here has made a New Year's resolution? Anybody? Yeah, uh, me either. I didn't either. I saw some funny memes about New Year's resolutions, and I wanted to share them with you. And here's one that I saw. Uh, you know, brace yourself. The New Year's resolution gym members are coming. Okay, this is true. I, every year I'm at the gym, like all these people start coming. Oh, but what about this one here? Uh, me listening to everyone's New Year's resolutions. <laughs> yeah, look, you're, I saw one that said, if you've made a New Year's resolution and you already said, I'm going to wait till Monday, you've already failed. And what about this last one here? Made a New Year's resolution to stop swearing, then I came to work. So I know some of you people, you know, you got some dirty mouths. All right. So, and those are funny, but, uh, you know, I just welcome you here. I'm glad that you're here. If you're watching online as well, in my prayer, um, even though there's a, a little bit of us here this morning, that God moves and that God speaks to us. And this is time well spent. So let's stand together. I'm going to pray. We're going to worship a little bit together. Father God, we love you. And we just celebrated your birth, Jesus. And some of us are headed into the new year, maybe a little bit tired, maybe a little bit weary. Give us the strength that we need coming into this new year. Give us the peace and the joy that we need coming into this new year. And we worship you. And we know that you are faithful and we love you. Thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's get our hands together.
discouraged we rejoice with a song of thanksgiving I will rejoice I will rejoice in whatever circumstance I'm in whatever I'm going through I will stand and proclaim that you are God Jesus and I will rejoice yes I will rejoice I will shout of your goodness forever again and again we'll just sing it out and I will rejoice yes I will rejoice I will shout of your goodness forever again and again comes our way, Lord. We worship you, we worship you, Lord. We sing this with you. We are the set against you. And I'm surrounded on all sides. But I heard you can bark the wall. So in your name, come and turn the tides, Jesus. I'm a sailor, a sailor at this mountain. A chance I'm getting through. We believe it this morning, but I heard they can melt before. So in your name, I'm asking it to move. Whatever it is, God, move it this morning. I say, let them break through.
just raise your hands up as we sing this. If you're watching online, raise your hands. Our story isn't finished. You're in it, God. We believe it this morning. Let's sing. As long as you're in it, the story's not finished. I know you've overcome, so I know I'll overcome, yeah. As long as you're in it, the story's not finished. I know you've overcome, so I know I'll overcome, yeah. Come on. As long as you're
new year and to this new chapter may we put you first God and whatever trial that we face whatever things we have to deal with in the new year God we pray your blessing we pray your deliverance your redemption your love and your grace over all of us this morning God for you are faithful in whatever storm and whatever Whatever sea is crashing down, God, we raise a hallelujah to you because you are worthy, God. For you are a God who loves us, who sent his one and only son, Jesus, for us, for our sin, for our shame, God. For that, we offer a song of thanksgiving, God. We raise a hallelujah to you, God. For everything in us this morning, we raise it. We raise our voice to you. We worship you, God. us we just walk through a hard season where we were reminded of maybe a loss a pain some of us this was our first Christmas and New Year's without somebody that we loved in our life but yet God in those moments in our weakness may we raise a hallelujah. May we raise a, th- a song of thanksgiving to you, God, because you, you are here and you're loving us. We thank you for that. And we love you. In Jesus' name, let's say it together. Amen, amen. Why don't you guys have a seat? We're just going to take a quick moment. We're going to receive um, and worship together by giving. And uh, ushers, if you want to come forward, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray over the prayer wall. And if you're new to TVC, we have a prayer wall um, over here uh, to my right. And you can go over there at any time. And uh, you'll see it was strobing over there. And fill out a piece of paper, put it in the wall. And uh, I'm going to pray over those. So, God, we love you. We know that you are good. We know that you are great. So God, right now, bless us as we give. We pray over the prayer requests in the prayer wall, God, each and every one. God, you know those prayers. God, I pray for every prayer that's on our heart this morning that maybe we haven't written down or said, but you know it's on our heart. I pray for those who are, who are sick today. I pray for your healing hand to move in and heal because you are a God that heals. I pray for those who feel a a great sense of loneliness today, God, that you move in and you fill them with your peace and your presence because they are not alone. I pray for those who are fighting addictions, God, that this would be the year where they can overcome that addiction and find victory through you because you are faithful. And now we worship you with our gifts. We love you. In Jesus' name, let's say it together. Amen. Amen.
Well, good morning, everyone. How are you all doing this new year, 2022? Okay. All right. We can work with that. We can work with that. Well, Happy New Year. I am so glad that you guys chose to brave the weather and come on out today. And a special welcome to those online as well. Happy New Year. I do hope that you guys have already had some fun celebrating this new year. How many of you guys wish you could have a do-over from this holiday season? Like maybe you spent most of the time feeling bloated, and if you could go back, you would choose to not have that last piece of pie that just pushed you over the edge. Or maybe you wish you could go back and have a do-over with a conversation you had with a family member that just didn't go well. Perhaps you saw the look on your wife's face when she opened the present that you got her this Christmas, and you're thinking, man, I wish I could have a do-over and get something different. Well, this uh, past year, we incorporated do-overs into our family, and we originally did this as a way to help our daughter learn how to make a wrong into a right, but now it's a rarity that a day will go by where I'm not asking for a do-over. So when I'm short or snippy with my husband or my daughter, I'll go back to them and say, hey, can I get a do-over? It gives me the opportunity to rewind the conversation and say things in a way I wish I would have, in a kinder way. Well, one of the holiday get-togethers we went to is on my husband's side of the family, and those are just absolutely insane because there's 10 kids all under the age of nine, so us adults were just, you know, doing zone coverage, and we consider it a win if we make it through the holiday injury-free. Uh, well, my daughter, Hebsey, she uh, was playing with one of her cousins, and the cousin just yanked the toy right out of her hand. So, of course, she was upset about that. So she came up to me, and she said, hey, Mom, she took my toy, and she didn't even ask me for a do-over. And um, it was at that point that I realized, wow, this do-over thing has really become a cultural part of our family. And I do love it because it's an awesome way to show your family member that you're listening, that you care. Um, but there are some areas in life where you don't get a do-over. One of those obvious areas to me is in sports. You don't often get a do-over in sports. When I was in college, I had the opportunity to run track, and one of the events that I did was uh, often relays. And so I remember this one particular relay. It was at Nationals. It was a four by 100, and me and my teammates were just ready to go. We had been running that race together throughout the entire season, and we felt really good, like we were going to come out on top. Well, um, we got going, and it got to be my turn, so I got up to speed and reached behind me to grab the baton. And as I did, I just knocked the baton out of my teammate's hand up into the air. It rolled off the track. And I wished I could have a do-over for that moment. Because it's those crucial moments where you're going to go right from first all the way to last place. Well, as I continue to uh, process this idea of do-overs, I realize there's other places where it doesn't work super well. Like in dating, you don't often get a do-over in dating. If you mess up enough, you're out, right? And same with your job. You don't often get do-overs at work. Like, try it out this next month, just don't show up to work, and then go to your boss and say, hey, can I get a do-over from the last month? And they'll probably say, yeah, you can have a do-over at a different job. <laughs> well, um, I, love I love processing this because there are so many areas, even though it's a good thing to ask for a do-over, there are a lot of areas where it doesn't quite work. We can certainly learn from our failures. We can learn from our mistakes. We can learn more from those specific moments we wish more than anything we could go back and do them over. I've heard from parents who have said, if I could just get a do-over, I would have been present with my kids. Like, I, I'd go back, I'd be a different parent. And same with people on the other side of divorce who'd say, if I could just do it over, I would have been different. I would have been different with my husband or with my wife. And, and there's people that we all know who have epically blown up their life, who have said, if I could just get, just get a do-over, I would have been different. I wonder, though, if we actually got an opportunity to go back, to have a do-over, would we actually be any different? Because whatever was our mindset at the time, whatever was our value system, whatever was inside us that drove us to make the decisions that we made, if we went back as that same person, I 
think we just make the same decisions over and over again. Because unless something changes in our value system, in our mindset, in the way we view reality, I think we just keep making the same decisions over and over again. And it's not usually that we make devastating decisions. Often our regret is born in those small moments where maybe nobody even noticed. But we just made a decision that was slightly off from the person that we wanted to be. And often the tricky part in life is that regret is not born out of also those moments where we blew up our life, like made one decision that changed everything. Sometimes, but not most of the time. It often comes because we never made the daily decisions necessary to become the person that we wanted to be. How do we live in such a way this year, this new year, 2022, where at the end of the year, we're not saying, I left so much undone. I wish I could have a do-over. I want us to read a passage from Philippians, and this is chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. I hope it can inspire us this new year to step into the life that God has created for us. Verse 7, it says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, being coming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all of this or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Just before Paul writes these words, he takes a moment to describe his life before he had a connection with Christ. He almost gives us like a resume. He says, I was a Hebrew. I was a Pharisee, a devout follower of the law. Like if anyone could have a reason to have a fulfilled life outside of God, Paul says, that was me. And then Paul has this incredible encounter with God and his life is turned upside down. He's no longer driven by prestige, status, or hate. He begins to be driven by love. And that incredible moment drives him to this place where he says, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Here's the challenging thing. The one thing that will steal our life from us is this life. And Paul says, I had everything that this life had to offer. I had status, I had prestige. In his culture, he was it. Like People looked up to him and wanted to be him. And yet he found himself empty. I wonder how many of us have already stepped into that dilemma, that the more we seem to get in this life, the more we can seem to feel empty. And this is a hard thing to learn from someone else's experience, right? Because none of us want a rich person coming up to us and saying, Don't pursue wealth. It's meaningless. There's nothing in it for you. Or someone who's been super successful saying, don't pursue success. It's just, it doesn't bring you any good feelings. It's it's meaningless. And I'm looking at both of them and I'm saying, yeah, I can see how success and money has really slowed you down in life. But that's kind of what Paul's saying here. He's saying, I had all of those things. I had status, prestige. I'm sure wealth came along with that at that time period And yet, he found himself empty. Paul had a shift in his mindset, in the way that he viewed reality, that led him to this point where he said, whatever were gains to me, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. I mean, he even goes on to say, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. 
Paul's describing losing everything in order to gain something far better. How do we live a life where at the end of it we're not saying, I wish I could have a do-over? I think the answer is that we don't let the things in this life steal our life from us. And I mean, isn't that truly the dilemma? Because the things in this life are great. They're fabulous. And, and God did create them for us. They're good things. But the true crisis happens in our lives when we turn all of our affection toward these good things and replace the God who created everything good. And we leave no room for him in our lives. Paul says, I've discovered everything is a loss in contrast to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. Paul discovered that the only way to live a fulfilled life was to want him most. So challenging because we want God to help us get all the things, the good things in life we think are going to make us happy. And it's as if God is trying to change our thinking. He's saying, I've created good things for you, but if you take all of these good things and turn them into a replacement for me, you're going to find yourself empty. When you step into a connection with God, into a relationship with God, we all soon find out that the best that there is is nothing in comparison to what a life can be in a relationship with God. Sometimes we look to relationships to fulfill that emptiness, that longing inside of us. And the reality is your husband will never be enough. Your wife will never be enough if you keep expecting them to be what only God can be to you. I actually think this sometimes leads us to putting unfair expectations on our spouses or on our kids because we want them to fill that void inside of us, the void that only God can fill. Maybe you're here and you're in a dating relationship and you're expecting him or her to be to you what only God can be to you. Or maybe it's our career and we're looking to our career or to our job to fill that emptiness inside of us that only God can fill. And when this doesn't work out well for us, we get the idea, well, maybe I'm in the wrong career or maybe I'm in the wrong relationship. The reality is most of us are in the wrong pursuit. We have to want him most. This is a hard one for me because there's a lot of times in life where I don't want God most. I don't know if you can relate to me on that, but every time I'm not in a connection with God, when I'm not pursuing him, I begin to feel empty. I don't know how to quite describe it, but when I am in a connection with God, when I'm pursuing him, everything in life is just better. My relationships are better. My attitude is better. And I don't think it's because I've just changed and I see all the beauty and wonder in this world that's all around me. I think it's that I'm no longer looking to things to fulfill that deepest longing that's inside me. And I start to enjoy life for what it is instead of what it isn't. If we want to live a life where we leave nothing undone, where we're not waiting for that do-over, we can't let the things in this life steal our life from us. The only way we can live a life that's fulfilled is to want him most. You know, then Paul goes on and he says, not that I've already obtained all of this or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. This is a little confusing because it's saying, take hold of what's already been taken hold of for you. And um, I think he's actually telling us, look, if we want to live our lives without regret, we have to want him most, but we also have to want the life that he's created for us. And this is a little crazy, but when Jesus died on the cross, he rose from the dead, his death took hold of the life for you and for me, and he's holding it for us. Have you ever put something on hold? Like I uh, remember passing by the layaway desk at Kmart as a kid, and I'd, especially around the holidays, people would be putting stuff on hold. They're like, I don't want this to sell out before I have the opportunity to buy it. And if you're younger, maybe you can better relate to when the new iPhone comes out and we all rush to Apple to say, put my name on it. I have to have it. I heard the camera might be better. Um, so I know I can't get it for the next year, but put it on hold for me. That's kind of what Jesus has done for us. 
He took hold of the life we were created to live, and he's holding it for us. He's ready to give it to us whenever we want it. Did you get a gift this year, and as you opened it up, you're trying to guard your expression on your face, but your immediate thought is, I wonder who I can re-gift this to. Um, Whenever we give someone something they don't want, its value is absolutely irrelevant. Jesus is holding on to your life and on to my life, but until we want it, there's no point in giving it to us. We're just going to re-gift it. It'll feel like an imposition. There'll be no value in it for us. It's as if we're saying, God, can you get out of my way so that I can live the life that I want to live? But Paul's saying, not that I've already obtained all this or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. So Jesus grabbed onto you and onto me so that we could grab onto life. You know, I think most of us, we think Jesus is an expert in the afterlife, but not so much the before life. And we get it. I mean, we got to buy into this afterlife thing because nobody else is building up there. It's the timeshare we've got to have, and he's building mansions. So we have to get in on that. But it's as if we're trusting God to build our afterlife, but not so much our before life. It's the crazy reality, but if, we, if Jesus is not trustworthy and worthy of building our life before death, he's certainly not trustworthy and worthy of building our life after death. If we can't trust him with the 70, 80, 90 years that we get on this planet, how can we trust him for an eternity? Paul goes on to say in verse 13, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to take a hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. And then verse 16, only let us live up to what we've already attained. If we're going to live a life where there's no regret, where there's nothing left undone, we're not waiting for that do-over, we have to fight for what is ours. I think this sounds a bit like a contradiction to me because I'm like, if I already attained it, why do I have to fight for it? Why do I have to pursue it? Why do I have to keep striving? We're not going to realize what's been given to us until we want it. And I think that's the true fight, the fight for our affections, the fight for our value system. And both my husband and I, we've been on many missions trips, and now we've adopted two girls from India. We actually leave Tuesday to pick up our second daughter. And the last time we were in India, we just had this incredible moment. I mean, we looked at the piles of trash in the streets. We looked at the slum where, slums where there's thousands of people living in these little huts. We saw the street children where there's millions of kids living in the street, and we just looked at each other, and we were like, we are so blessed. We are so blessed. I mean, we have three toilets in our house, and we were looking at an entire slum with thousands of people who have one hole in the ground outhouse. I mean, that's called luxury, living in luxury. We have a toilet for each member of the family currently. So that is pure luxury. And we looked at each other and they had this beautiful moment where we said, we're not going to want more. We already have so much in this life. We are so incredibly blessed. Well, we get back from India, about six months pass, passes and things just start to shift a bit. Like I looked at this SUV and I'm like, I think that would be really great to have. Maybe in the next year or two we can go for that. And we we started looking at other houses and maybe property to build. We're like, it'd be great to have, you know, a more wooded view and, you know, it'd be awesome to have a more modern home. It's as if we started drifting. I do have to pause here and say, if God has blessed you financially, you have a nice car, a nice house, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. I'm using this analogy to say it is so easy to get caught up in thinking that more things, better job, a bigger career, a different car will somehow fulfill that longing that is inside of us. It truly is a fight to live a life where we don't look back and say, I wish I could have a do-over. If I could go back, I would have reprioritized. I want to challenge us this year to just a couple of things. And the first thing is to let go. You know, we all know it's impossible to live a life with zero regret. But for some of us, we're holding on to hurts that we've caused or past hurts from other individuals, and we're using it as a way to predict our future. 
I can't tell you how many times I've said, I do this because that happened to me, or I do this because it's how I've always been. I'm never gonna change, I've tried to, and I just don't. The past can have a hold on us like nothing else. And Paul says, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. You know, I'm not sure that he's saying I forget the past completely, but I think he is saying, I'm going to let go of the past. I think letting go often starts with forgiveness. You know, maybe there's a wound that's been caused to us that is significant. It's potentially horrible. Maybe it's time to work towards forgiveness of that wound. Or maybe you've hurt someone and you're like, I don't even know how anyone could forgive me for this because of what I've done. Maybe it's time that you forgive yourself. Forgiveness isn't about saying what was done was okay. It's not okay. But it is saying, I'm no longer going to let this wound that I've caused or this wound that's been caused to me, I'm not going to let it define me anymore. Maybe you're here and you say, I can't tell you how many times I've already said if I could get a do-over. Maybe that's in your mind right now, just saying, there's a lot of do-overs I already wish I could have, maybe as a parent or in my marriage or different choices I made. Maybe this is your moment right now to say, I'm going to choose to let go of it. I'm going to let go of things from my past that I've just still have had weighing on me saying I wish I could have a do-over. That, you know, when we accept that grace and kindness that God has for us, we begin to be able to move into the life he's created for us to live. And that does bring me to my next thought for us, and that's to press on. Paul says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. You know, I talked a lot today about wanting God most and trying to live a life without regret. I so appreciate how Paul says, not that I've already attained this or have already arrived at my goal. It's as if he's saying, sometimes I mess up. Like sometimes I lose focus. Sometimes my priorities aren't what they should be. I think about that race where I drop the baton and I imagine Paul saying, I'm running this race of life and sometimes I drop the baton. Like, sometimes I mess up. Sometimes I lose focus. But then I reach down, I pick up the baton, and I choose to press on. Maybe you're here, and the best New Year's resolution you could ever make is to say, I want to pursue a connection with God every day. One of the things that has been most helpful to me in this is being a part of a tribe. A tribe is a community of people where We're all trying together. We're not always getting it right, but we're challenging each other to continue to press on in our relationship with God. Maybe you're here and and the best New Year's resolution you could ever say is, I'm just going to download the Bible app and I'm going to read the verse of the day or start a Bible plan. You know, wherever you're at in your journey, we would love as a church to come alongside you and support you in that. Maybe it's finding a tribe. Maybe it's learning uh, what your next step might be. We have the next step area out in the back. We'd love to talk to you today. Or if you're joining us online, post something in the comments. Wherever you're at, we'd love to support you in taking that next step toward your connection with God. You know, we all get one life, and at the end of it, we don't get a do-over. I recently heard this song. It's called Pray by Sam Smith, and I just want to read a few of the lyrics for you today. He says, I'm young and I'm foolish. I've made bad decisions. I block out the news, turn my back on religion, don't have no degrees. I'm somewhat naive. I've made it this far on my own, but lately they've been getting me higher. I lift up my head and the world is on fire. There's dread in my heart and fear in my bones, and I just don't know what to say. Maybe I'll pray, pray. Maybe I'll pray. I've never believed in it, And you know that I'm going to pray. You won't find me in church, no reading the Bible. I'm down on my knees. I'm begging you, please. I'm broken alone and afraid. I'm not a saint. I'm more a sinner. When I try to explain the words run away, that's why I'm stood here today. And I'm going to pray. 
pray for a glimmer of hope. I've never believed and you know, but I'm going to pray. As I listened to these words from this song, I couldn't help but feel overwhelmed because some days I just feel sorry for myself. Like you ever get there, you start to think, is what I'm doing, does it even matter? Does it have any significance? And then I hear these words from someone who's saying, I don't even know that you exist, God, but I'm going to pray. I don't know if there's anything that God loves more than that person who says, I don't even fully know what you're about, God, but I'm here and I'm going to pray. And it doesn't matter what job you have, what car you drive, what kind of status you have in life. We're all here with one singular purpose, and that is to be proof of God to a world that desperately needs him. Because there's men and women out there saying, God, where are you? Do you even exist? I'm looking for a glimmer of hope. And that's what you are. You're a glimmer of hope. Maybe you're here and you're saying, I can really resonate with that song because that's me. Like, I came in here today, and I don't even know about this whole God thing, but I felt like this was the way to start out the new year. Can we all just close our eyes for a minute and bow our heads? Maybe that's you where you're saying, God, I don't even know for sure what you're about. I don't even know if you're out there, but I'm here. I, I think I need you. I'm tired of doing this life alone. I don't want to leave anything in my life undone. If that's you, I want to ask you to pray this prayer with me. It's just one sentence. It's really simple. And if that's you, pray this with me. Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. I know there's going to be a whole lot more that you and God need to talk about, but this is where it begins because when you give Jesus your life, he comes inside you and brings you life. Maybe you're here and you say, I've given my life to Christ before, but I'm feeling kind of lost myself. Like my priorities haven't been quite what they need to be. I I think I'm struggling with things from the past. Can I just encourage you right now in this moment to reach out to God and Maybe you need to choose to let some things go that have been holding you back. And wherever you're at in your relationship with God, I want to just pray for you. God, we come to you and we're so aware of um, the lost feelings we can feel, the brokenness, the disconnection from you at times in life, God. And so the start of this year, 2022, wherever anyone's at, God, I just want to say, God, we're here. We don't have it all put together. We don't know everything. We keep dropping the baton of life at times, but God, we're here and we know that we need you. And so God, in Jesus' name, come and fill us. Come move in our lives. Help us to pursue you this year, God. Help us to not leave anything undone. In your name I pray. Well, if you did make a decision today, we celebrate with you. And we have a book that we'd love to get in your hands. It's called The Seven Basics. And um, you can just actually text the number right on the screen and we'll send it to you. It's a free resource. Um, If you're joining us online, put something in the comments and we will get that book right out to you. Well, thank you again for joining us at the beginning of 2022. And my hope and prayer for you and for me is they will choose to let go of the things we need to let go of this year, and they will choose to press on in our relationship with God. Have a great week.